Thank you for joining us on our second part of this program. Uh, we have Zoom running right now, so there are some guests that are in virtual land right now watching this panel discussion as well. Um, so we'll be doing kind of a dual thing. If there are questions that you folks have, um, there will be a microphone going around. Um, the really quick rundown is we're going to have each of our wonderful panelists say something really quick. And then my hope is that we can just dive into questions from the audience and from our Zoom members as well. Um, again, on behalf of the History Center, I'd like to thank you all for coming and to thank our event co-sponsors, including the Hawaii People's Fund, Purple Maia, and Namea Hawaii, mahalo. I would also like to send a, a special shout out uh, to our program organizers, Brianna Govea with the History Center. Um, yeah, thank you, Brianna. Um, Kanaka filmmaker Aina Paikai, who's uh, Project Hawaiian Soul. Uh, his project, uh, Hawaiian Soul, you may be familiar with, but if you haven't watched it, you need to watch it. Um, Imai Winchester. <laughs> Mahalo. Um, thanks for your dedication and support to continuing to spread the ike and lead the perpetuation of Laho Iho Iea. Um, finally, I'd like to thank Kumujano Sorio um, and our wonderful and distinguished uh, panelists here, all of whom individually are powerful, but I'm still sort of shocked that we got all of you to be up here on one panel in front of us. Um, <laughs> mahalo. So again, we're going to get started with um, just kind of a rundown from everyone. I'm going to encourage our Zoom folks to put in your questions into the Q&A little widget on Zoom, and we'll be tracking that. Um, we'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can. Um, we're going to, again, begin with about four minutes from each panelist. If you, if you have to go more, hey, you know what? That's fine with us. Um, once we get through questions, we're going to open it up to once we get through your uh, comments, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, one point, um, unfortunately, Kale Kuakael wouldn't couldn't be here tonight, um, so he sends his regards. But we got to see a little bit of him in the film earlier today. Um, what I wanted to do to start our discussion with each of our panelists is, and this is sort of my own reaction to this video, is introduce yourselves, and we're just going to start probably at that end with Kumujan, and we're just going to go down this way. Introduce yourselves. Um, and again, because I saw so many people on there that I knew who are no longer here, introduce yourself and someone else who's not here, that you want their name to be brought into this space. Um, and then you can give your manao, whatever manao you wanted to share with everyone. Um, so if I could, I'd like to start. I saw Uncle Sonny Kaniho out there. Um, I want to bring into this space my, my granddad, Pai Galdera from Waimanalo, who was a part of the the Hawaiians back in the day. Um, and he was good friends with uh, Uncle Sonny. So, Kumu John. Uh, mahalo nui. My name is Jonathan K. Kamakavivo Ole Ozori. I'm from Hilo, Hawaii. Um, and, and the person I want to bring to this was not on the film, but he gave extensive testimony. His name was Genesis Leloy from Kilkaha. He was a neighbor of ours and an uh, amazing man. Uh, so, I have like three minutes left. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, watching the film, and I think this is true for all of us, but it was, it was really, really poignant for me. I was 42 years old when I gave testimony to the Okolo Kolonui, and you know, I, I thought I was really smart and I thought I knew a lot of things, uh, but I didn't know anything. And, and so much of what has driven our movement has, has come after Okolo Kolonui, has come as a result of many young pe younger people uh, becoming involved in the struggle, becoming really politically active and becoming uh, scholars, um, whether they were scholars in a university or they, whether they were scholars of the land. Um, they have given us so much uh, to, to propel our movement forward. And, you know, I think one of the things that we will talk about tonight is where that movement is going and where we where we go to next and and 30 years from that event it seems like a good time and place to think about where we are the other thing that 
that was really brought home to me was how many people spoke of their suffering uh, at the hands of government, at the hands of investors and commercial enterprises, at the hands of educators, schools, churches. And how this was something we, we sort of, we all knew, those of us who were my age um, in the 1990s, we'd lived through it. But it, it strikes me that um, not much has changed there, that there's still many of our, and some of the same people, Marie, um, still struggling to live on the land, live in their homes, and not be harassed and moved and messed with. And at some point, you know, I would like to hear from some of the people who are here who have experienced that. Thank you. I'm probably one of the least familiar faces here. I was a very young, late 20s, not really young, but late 20s when this was happening. And um, Kikuni had asked me to speak on Vahikupuna. Um, there's a part of my heart that aches as I watch this because there's so much that still is completely relevant. I mean, much of the testimony could be given today. At the same time, um, a lot has changed. One of the people I want to bring in the room um, is my own sister, Julie Cachola, because so many of her good, good friends were in that video, Skippy and Mo and Kiola are people that she works um, really closely with. And um, one of the things that I'm proud that she was able to accomplish was being able to have um, Hawaiian Homes change some of the rules in terms of how and where you could establish your homestead. And the plans that she had um, worked on with Mo and Skippy um, have come into reality that there's, there's a way for um, homesteaders to be on lands that don't have infrastructure. So mahalo, kua ana. Um, and I, yeah, so much more to talk about, but I will stop here for now. Aloha kaku. Um, I'd like to honor Hank Fergustrom. He, uh, only because he brings things down to the nuts and bolts, like the price of rice and the price of bed and the price of poi. And even back then that was cheap, that's probably considered cheap now for a five pound bag of poi. But, um, you know, Bumpy Kanahele is one of the people being honored for La Hoi Hoi Eau this year, and um, we were talking when we were doing um, another program with him back in 1999, and I said, you know, we've done active war, we've done the tribunal, we've done several other things on sovereignty, and all of them are wrong, because <laughs> Keanu, this was pre Keanu Sai and his whole historical analysis of the fact that it's not a matter of opinion, it's a matter of international law, as far as the sovereignty thing goes. And um, I, I see that the conclusions by Moana Jackson about Hawaii being reinscribed on the list of non-self-governing territories, I'm going, oh my God, <laughs> do we want that going out to the world? <laughs> but, but Bumpy said, you know, Joan, it's okay to show the evolution of the Hawaiian understanding of sovereignty, to show the early times of the Kalahui Hawaii, in a nation within a nation, um, the UN thing, you know, all the ways that people have been thinking through the whole sovereignty thing. He said, it's good that people see that evolution of thought. So I feel, okay, that's good. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say, mahalo. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Joanne Sark. Um, I'm gonna assume Kekuni's in the room. So what I do, I'd like to bring is, um, somebody I lost recently, uh, many of us, uh, Dr. Aluli and Met Aluli. Um, they were quite they were champions and mentors for not just myself, but, but many of us. Uh, I was one of those people who, well, if you were 42, I was 43 when we had to testify. And we were lobbying for Native Hawaiian Health in particular. There were so many things that were unknown. Awareness was low about what the real problems were. A lot of our data was not accessible. We could not tell the whole story. Everybody else was telling our story. Um, and so that was my relationship with Kekuni initially. And then he says, yes, Joanne. Well, he would have that lowest, Joanne, you're gonna have to talk about the health conditions of Native Hawaiians at the tribunal. And of course it just terrified me because it's so naive to 
all the things connected to it. He had such the biggest overview um, of our condition. And it wasn't just health, it was everything. So it is it was hard to watch that movie, I have to say. Uh, great to see faces like Atitele Hanoa and you know people standing up, but um, encouraging to see how the conviction people had then. I, I'm getting older, I don't know how John feels, but you know a lot of our champions are on Makua now for us. Uh, I'm encouraged by the young people who can benefit by that work. Um, as Emmett told me, we still haven't worked hard enough. And I do feel that. I feel like, feel like maybe you feel like we, we took the wrong path or we could have explained it better, but he said we haven't worked hard enough. And so there's a lot of work still to do. And I was just blessed that I was one of those who Kekuni pulled into the circle and mentored us on showing up, doing our homework, and speaking up. And so I, I was grateful to have that mentorship. Aloha. It's very emotional to revisit 30 years ago and see all that's happened since, but then know a lot of things haven't. And when you add up all of the things that still have not our basic rights that still are not in place for all of us, I feel like we need to go forward with a way of putting that all together, that ceded lands are not ceded. We have to re-language everything so that it all goes back to direct points that can actually be solved. If we just keep living as one of the most violated places for our people, our culture, for the loss, the near extinction, and we're living our lives without adding this all up and making our case again in some way. I think it's something that we're always gonna regret because we're running out of time. So I just wanted to say a few words um, about Uncle Kekuni and how he got radicalized. Um, my mom is um, his kahiapo, and they spoke almost every day, and he and I and my mom and a lot of us here worked for many years together to report our health as a measure of racism, as a measure of the disparities that we live with. Why? Because everybody doesn't have a place to live. All the cases that were made by all the people who who were in this film, but also all the people who have stood up and fought for Waiahole, for Sand Island, for if Kalekoa was here, he would name about 15 of them that are always inside of him, Kalama Valley, on and on and on. And then we keep organizing around these things and going out and protesting in numbers that we have. But we have to realize we've advanced to the point where from 20,000 in the 1920s, we're now over 300,000 at home. We're over 400,000 away from home. There's got to be a way for us to organize those numbers so that we say, because we're forced into a diaspora and everything has been pushed up so that we're outpriced in our homeland, that's another measure of racism. And what we have to do is bring everybody home into affordable housing and all the lands that belong to us are returned to us. We can't just keep saying we wish it was that way. We actually have to take the steps forward. So the way Uncle K. Kuni got radicalized was that he saw not only the pain that John was talking about, but the numbers of people dying, the numbers of people homeless, the numbers of people without medicine, the numbers of people living in poverty. When I was at my niece's graduation from law school in Denver, the keynote speaker was the Attorney General of the Navajo Nation. And she had gone from living in a hogan made of mud and wood to Harvard for five years and then came back and went to live in a hogan made of mud and wood. And they didn't have water, they didn't have ele electricity, still don't, and six miles away from the, the, the road, the biggest highway that they're, that they're near. And she decided to redefine all of the law, American law, so that it actually works for her people. So one of the things she started with was redefining what poverty is. And she said, it's financial exploitation for people who don't live with money. 
who people that have to pay more taxes than the money they make, it's exploitation. And so she urged all of the people that graduated with their law degrees, the young people, she said, be guerrilla activists with the laws that work against you. Redefine them, make them work, add everything up so that like Troy has been doing work on Hawaiian homelands. Yeah, we know a lot of lands were given without water and without the ability to grow anything. But why are we over a hundred years later still accepting that that was done to us? One of the things that I want to read to you is um, just because it was brought up so much in the film and because we're facing all the, the climate changes and crises that we that we are. I mean, one example, Red Hill, okay? The military's on over a quarter of our lands. Do you think that Red Hill is the only place that's been contaminated? It's everywhere they've gone. It's lead poisoning. It's the forever chemicals. It goes on and on. The news reported this week that in the United States, over half of the drinking water of the US is contaminated with forever chemicals. The EPA is not working. The Supreme Court is not working. The government itself is trying to wage this war between Ku Klux Klan, white racism, su supremacists, and the rights of all people. I mean, we really need to take some things into our own hands. What I want to read about is because the history of a tribunal came out of World War II because of the Holocaust. And whenever people are living under unjust laws and under international law, we have the right to convene a tribunal. And the convening of that tribunal is to bring forward all of the things that are written as violations in the, gen in the genocide convention. Genocide means, this is an international law definition, that any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, of A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction in whole or in part, D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group in times of peace or war, whether by constitutionally responsible rulers, public officials, or private individuals. So one of the things that allowed us as indigenous peoples to go to the UN was because genocide has been committed on all of us. So when we got there, we all started reporting on genocide. A lot of health violations and many violations that we saw in the, in the tribunal and that we know about. But because we were so strong in our testimonies, they made it illegal for us to use the word genocide. So we had to keep reinventing things and bringing up things and supporting each other. And a lot of it was like life sources are treated as resources. They're commodified. They're turned into profit. All the decisions are made according to the profit-driven incentives and how much something is worth according to money. Not how long will our clean water last for future generations. So a lot of us got to know each other and work in working groups. And you know, during the 10 years that we were there, by the time we left, we kind of knew, OK, we're not only fighting for survival of our people, our cultures, and our future. We're fighting for winning a battle here so that then we can try to be prepared to save the world when the transnationals try, try to take over by recreating and inventing themselves as the 1% of the world that owns everything, controls everything, makes all the laws and punishes everybody else. So it was a huge time of awakening for people. And even though the UN is not the answer to everything, it gave us a chance to come together. And by the end of the 10 years, everyone was presenting wisdom. And everybody was saying, OK, this is what we're missing. We're missing that all of our laws are based on the natural ability for regeneration, the natural ability and kuleana of human beings to transform and protect. 
the natural rights of regeneration. So one example, when I lived in Kona, I was working as a fish pond manager in the ancient ponds, and we also had aquaculture to create more limu because the ponds were missing limu, and that's a, a key element to attract the right fish. And so the kupuna were teaching us many, many, many different things, but one thing they told us was, do you see from Malka to Makai, right above a, you know, a certain place? That's because from the forest, we planted ulu. From the ulu, we planted niu. Now the clouds come all the way down. Now the rain comes all the way down. So this is the interaction that we have as human beings. This is like part of our full responsibility. And it's starting to come back in the next generations, but we need to provide the land and the water. It needs to all be there in, all, in whole. The health of our aina is the health of us. The health of our water is the health of us. But it's now part of a recovery process because of the historical grief, because of the trauma, because how long it's been since we all have had our aina. And what the queen said, Lili Ookalani said, is that the voice of the people is the voice of God. And she uttered those words after the Ku'e petitions were signed by every living Kanaka Maoli at the time. At the time of the tribunal, we were looking for them because they express the political will and the legal evidence of our people against annexation or any form of colonization in any shape or form is what they said. So some of these things that our kupuna have left us, clues, documents, laws, the lands that they kept talking about that keep being missing, our kupuna left in perpetuity to us collectively as a people. At the time of statehood, they were called the five F lands. 20% of the revenues from those five F lands were supposed to go to support our people. So as you saw, it's the harbors, it's you know the, the places where the university is, all the airports, everything that makes billions of dollars all the time is what was supposed to come to us. Not that we want the money instead of our lands, but if there's 700,000 of us now and we're moving towards a million and there's only a million point five people in Hawaii, we can become the people of Hawaii again and use the money for the housing and for everything else that's needed and to keep golf courses from taking over, to keep all of the poisoned waters, you know, from being poisoned not only by the military, but everybody that uses the aina and puts poison in them, which is a lot. We need to do that inventory. We need to be aware of how much damage has been done and how we can stop it. And if we are reaching nearly a million people, every vote has to count and every voice has to count. And we have to become informed on a level where we create an energy field of protecting our aina. So the last thing I'll say right now is that I was very, very close, not only to my uncle, but to John Kaimikawa. And John and his halau gave the oli at each of the islands. And two days before he died, he called me and said, Melani, we have to go back to the people. We need to spend all the rest of our time responding to them because we have made another film called Amau Amau, and it's about Aina governance. And Aina governance in the way that John taught it comes from the family systems, not from the Lili'i, but way before. And Aina governance in the way he presents it is that every aspect of the land and of our culture and of the mana and mana'o of our people comes through a maukea oka aina ikapono, wisdom, the right intentions, the right decisions, the right actions, the right outcomes. How does that happen? It happens because all the realms of the ahupua'a, if they are protected by different people and different families, and every time a decision is made, all those people come together, and they don't represent just what they want to do on their part of the aina. They represent what's happening to the aina. If there's introduced species, or if there's a virus, whatever it is, 
the representation of the people and the aina is intertwined. And that's what protects life. So I just wanted to mention him and also to say um, something in honor of my uncle is that we worked together on creating the um, Papa Olokahi, the Native Hawaiian Healthcare System and the Native Hawaiian um, Healthcare Act, Healthcare Improvement Act. But one of the things that he really wanted to see happen was for us to go back to an Afwa'a system like governance, like John had presented to and others, so that we're truly representing our aina and our people. And that whenever decisions are made, they're made according to the condition of the aina, the water, the people, and everything that's happening there. And he was very um, sure that if more and more people were involved in every single aspect of health, that health would then completely flourish because we would all be upholding it. And one of the things he wanted was for there to be a plan, whether it was one plan that we all agreed to, which is kind of impossible, or if it was a plan from each ahupua or each family or each community that upheld the, our, not only our rights, but our realization of what our kuleana is, that this would move things forward. So my uncle and John had similar ideas coming from different worlds. And I wanted to, to express that. Out of the tribunal came the public law 103-150, the first apology by a superpower to any indigenous peoples or nation. And that was to us. And within it, it defines our inherent sovereignty, that our inherent sovereignty can never be taken away from us. It's inherent. It's been with us way before the US was ever even formed. So we have to redefine that for ourselves and all the things that really matter. And we have to do it now, nonakeiki. Are we really gonna leave our children and our mo'opuna without a plan? So I just wanna say that I'm so glad everybody is here tonight because I really feel like we're at the point where we can do this. Mahalo. Good evening, and uh, thank you to the organizers for um, allowing me to share what I uh, knew of the tribunal and uh, associated ideas. Um, I have been away from Hawaii for a few years, and uh, this is the first day that I feel that I'm back in the Hawaii I left, where lots of Kanaka Maoli were always looking at how to terminate the awful situation into which the US has placed you. I mean, I've been back, but not with such a, with a group of people so actively focusing on those very important questions. Um, I would like to just say a couple of things as I uh, prepared for today. It occurred to me that during the time that I've been in Hawaii, which started in around 1971, um, there really has been two movements of activism in the Kanaka Maoli from my, as I saw, as I see it as a non-Kanaka Maoli, this is what I could see. Um, and it was, uh, it, it became very clear to me that that's what was happening as I prepared for this evening's uh, discussion. Uh, Kekuni was almost entirely focused on what the people, uh, the Kanaka Maoli people needed and wanted. And that was to recover their, the culture and the resources that they had before the white man came in. And so he was focused very much on recovering um, the integrity and high value of the life of the Kanaka Maoli before outsiders came in. And I, as a professor of international law who worked with him, 
had to figure out what international law mechanism or international fora would best advance that particular focus of his. And for me, the mechanism in international law that could be of assistance is that of self-determination of a people. Alongside or some and sometimes in harmony with, sometimes divergent from each other, was another uh, stream of activism in Hawaii since I've been here. And that one was more focused on politics, the recovery of a state. Okay, so on the one hand, you had a culture and resources for a people, and on the other hand, was a focus on, you know, nation within a nation or independence. Uh, or, uh, and, and so that the word sovereignty is what motivated and reigned supreme in that second stream. In the first stream, uh, that word sovereignty is about a state, it's not about a people. But that's, that's the parlance in international law. Because of these two streams occurring concurrently in Hawaii, the, the two terms somewhat got mixed up, which is okay, there's nothing magical about the terms. But I think that it is at the same time important to know that they are related, but, but in one sense very different. And pursuing either self-determination of the Kanaka Maoli people or sovereignty of a heavily Kanaka Maoli state uh, require different approaches, okay? Now, uh, it so happens that if your focus is on a state and recovering, let us say, the state that was when Queen Liliuokalani uh, was deposed, she actually was in charge of a sovereign state that included cultural groups other than Kanaka Maoli. And that's what a state to this day in international law uh, is required to do. It is not allowed anymore under international law to have a state that is ethnically homogeneous or ethnically discriminatory. Now, there, you know, it's important to both choose to realize the self-determination of the Kanaka Maoli people, but can you do that without also taking charge uh, of, a, of a governing state? Now, it's, it's possible, especially since the United Nations passed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples carves out a special set of rights for Indigenous Peoples, even if they are part of a larger state that is multi-ethnic. Okay, so in my view, what we need to look at is how we address those two approaches, the realization of the full blossoming of Kanaka Maoli culture, with its very uh, startling and, and beautiful attachment to respect for the land and resources, while at the same time taking charge or at least participating with others in this archipelago to take charge of the governing structure. So they are two, dis two distinct things. What kind of culture and values do we seek you know, and when I say we, I mean, in this situation, the Kanaka Maoli are the indigenous peoples here, and, and they have, when left alone, developed an extraordinary relationship with nature, which, you know, should be emulated by all peoples in the world. But what is the mechanism by which you can do that? It's not by becoming a sovereign state, so to speak, that alone will assure that, because I come from a, the third world, uh, Vietnam, where we fought for independence and we focus on independence, our own government. So then what did the powerful Western colonial countries do? They say, okay, how can we keep things the same while it looks different? And how we keep things the same, they decided, 
was to push capitalism, development, the buying, the co-optation of the governing of the, color, of the local uh, colonized people, right? In, uh, so that it's even, it's even easier for capitalism when the person stealing the land, the resources looks just like you. In other words, you know, a Vietnamese dictator can much do far more for the French in Vietnam than the French could do for themselves. Do you see what I'm trying to say here? So it seems to me that we do need to pursue both um, goals and, and figure out what do we want those two goals to realize for us? And secondly, what are the measures that we can use to pursue both those goals and realize them? And, you know, um, I have worked much more on um, the, the safeguarding of indigenous uh, cult cultures, peoples and cultures, than I have on forms of government. So, I, but I will say both. If you don't have an a government independent from uh, a horror like the United States, your chances of being able to preserve the indigenous culture is much reduced, much more difficult. So it would be far more promising to have an in a government independent from such a powerful and horrible uh, overlord, you know. Uh, but Again, the third world is replete with independent countries who have sold out entirely via their leaders to predatory global capitalism. Okay, so, so I think that this is, uh, and, and Kekuni, um, you know, uh, really he, his focus was entirely on the maka ainana and the culture and the values and the pono relationship of human to nature. And that was also, uh, something that I felt most comfortable with. So I was very happy and privileged to have worked that long with Kekuni and, uh, you know, in, um, and, and form part of the Komike uh, for the tribunal because we felt that we had to expose what the United States did here. We had to begin to lay the foundation for getting rid of the United States, for, for kicking it out of Hawaii, basically. I don't mean Americans, I don't mean a particular ethnic group, I mean another country particularly as powerful as the United States. Uh, but, but if we did that and then just ended up in the situation in which former colonies of the third world are, we would have missed our goal, our primary goal. Okay, so um, uh, I would suggest that some of the mechanisms that we can use are, they will be different in our pursuit of self-determination and the preservation of the Pono relationship of Kanaka Maoli uh, people as, as uh, celebrated by their culture requires certain mechanisms and tactics and independence of sovereign entity within which the Kanaka Maoli will live, right? requires different mechanisms. Uh, I hope I haven't totally confused you, but uh, so let us say right now you have, uh, Hawaii is part of the United States, unfortunately, right? I mean, it's, it, it, it's viewed by the rest of the world as part of the United States. So as long as, she, and now the United States is, you know, facing China to try and decide and in order to, to contest who controls the Pacific. So this is, if it hasn't been so before, this is surely the time to get out of the United States so that you're not involved in that particular battle, right? Now the measure on that would be to uh, several, and I don't, I, you know, it'll take all of us and, and, and friends and allies to figure out how to do it. But the very first thing is to form a sort of um, Pacific Islander community, because this is where the big fight between China and the US is going to be, right? And um, when I first came to Hawaii in 1971, there was an organization that was very promising. It was called the Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific. And Soli Nihel, whom you saw in there, was the Hawaii delegate to that. 
and you know it would have banned any nuclear uh, nuclear free zone the pacific they wanted to declare the pacific a nuclear free zone and there's nothing that will dis devastate the environment we love and respect as surely as obviously a nuclear explosion in the pacific so we do have to pay attention to that and so that is the Caribbean countries that are small, like the Pacific Island countries, have formed the Caribbean group. And as because of that, they have been able to get certain things through international fora that each island country alone would have had a hard time to do. So I think that's one of the things that we can, one of the mechanisms that we should entertain, grow uh, to help us achieve our goals in tandem with uh, other Pacific Island things, and they too have an interest in not becoming the battleground between the, China, the China, between the two superpowers, China and the U.S. So that's one mechanism there. Uh, I think that the other mechanism for independence from the U.S. is to study and uh, explore whether we should spend, uh, whether we could profitably reactivate the decolonization movement that was supposed to be uh, enacted in Hawaii. In, um, let me put it this way, that um, after the Second World War, all the third world countries wanted independence from the Western powers, right? So they got self, and they all invoke the principle of the self-determination of peoples to rationalize, to push for independence. So the linkage is there between self-determination and statehood, your own statehood. Um, now, the, um, the UN, you know, was it a mechanism which third world countries, which, which, ex -colon, which the colonies used, where they acted, agitated to have the UN uh, recognize their right to independence. All right? And, and so um, after, um, the African countries, for example, use the UN to a considerable degree uh, to do that. And the Secretary General at that time, Dag Hammarskjöld, was totally um, uh, supportive. And that's probably why uh, he was killed by, in, while riding an airplane to one of the African countries. Uh, marks of the CIA seem to be around that particular accident, right? But um, what I want to say is this, that um, so the Soviet Union at that time was the main challenger of the colonial past because they, the, the, the Soviet Union, I mean, at, in Russia did not have colonies. Right, at least, at least they, you, the people, the ethnic minorities around Moscow might, would say otherwise, that in one sense they were held almost like colonies, but they did not have formal colonies overseas. All right, so Russia was very much um, supporting the demand for independence of Asian and African and Latin American countries. So the US was terrified that the Russians would make headway in that part of the world. So they agreed that they should act as if they too favored independence, all right? And so um, they, um, they basically agreed that, that self-determination of peoples is something that the UN should support. And, uh, but the colonial past was still very powerful in the UN. So they said, well, what is the colonial past? Uh, what is a colony? Let us, the masters of those colonies, decide whether we have colonies or not. Okay, so that was already uh, uh, hanky panky. Let's put it that way. And um, the English and the French were urged by the Americans to quickly counter the Soviet Union by agreeing to name their colonies and 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 start working on. Uh, they're achieving independence. But France and England, etc., were very reluctant to say that they had any colonies. So it was Mrs. Roosevelt who decided that we should also, we the Americans should set the example and admit who are our colonies in order to shame them into naming theirs. So actually, at that time, right, uh, and 
with the, under the Roosevelt administration, they didn't call them colonies, but they said, yes, we have some non-self-governing territories, right? And, they, and Hawaii was listed as a non-self-governing territory. All right, so then the UN, after the Second World War, now filled up with ex-colonies who wanted any, everybody else who was still colonized to be decolonized. So they were pushing for the UN to declare that all non-self-governing territories are also in, entitled to independence. Now, the US seeing this was terrified that Hawaii and all its possessions would now go the route of independence. So they decided to hold, and, and that was, so that was in 1959, when the rumblings of moving non-self-governing territories in that category into the category of colonies who had to be decolonized. So what the US did was to say, quick, quick, let's have an election in Hawaii, which would be predestined result that the people there want to stay with the United States. So you see the linkage there. Yeah, and that's how come the, it, it, held, it, it held the election in 1959. And if the wrong was committed to the, the citizens of the former sovereign kingdom of Hawaii, then it is they who should decide what the future should look like. But it appears to me that Every American soldier just fresh off the boat living in Hawaii also voted in the 1959 election. And, uh, and the Hawaiians, by, Kanaka Maoli, by and large, boycotted that or because the choice was ridiculous. It was, do you want to become, an, do you want to immediately become a US state? And the, the alternative, or remain a territory of the US. So with, if you became a state, you had many more rights than if you remained a, uh, just you know, a territory of the United States. So that, I think that study, uh, research, writing on the actual statehood vote is really very important because it could be a basis for a mechanism to go back to the UN and say, we voted. And the US said, that's it, they've decided that they love us, want to be part of us, and they have made a decision about their political future, and therefore we can remove them from the non-self-governing list, all right? So the, the point is that the mechanism might be, even if it does nothing much more than generate a lot of publicity around the issue, to ask for the reinstatement of Hawaii on the non-self-governing territories list. Okay, that's just that's just one. But but for the other part, the part, the mechanism that I think is most helpful for the other stream of activism, the self-determination of peoples and the Pono relationship that we wish to have with our resources, is to immediately begin to use the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because it it recognized the right of indigenous peoples of Kanaka Maoli to all sorts of things. I mean, very important rights uh, have been, and, they, and they, the US has adopted that with Obama saying, well, actually we already do all of these things with our indigenous peoples, which is total BS, of course, right? But you can push for, the, for this state to adopt the declaration at its own policy and use that to initiate the Pono relationship of the Kanaka Maoli culture back in this, in this archipelago. All right, I mean, I think that those are the two avenues that, that I see that could be uh, triggered simultaneously, but understand that they're different. Now, here's the last word I'm going to say about this. We here have, in a way, use the word sovereignty as far as international law parlance is concerned somewhat incorrectly and loosely because sovereignty under international law is an attribute of a state it is not an attribute of a people self-determination is the right of a people sovereignty is what the state that governs that people has okay so that's why kekuni hardly ever used the word sovereignty because he was focused on what the people needed 
what governing structure can come it, it, it's in a lesser question than but the reason that we do it in the us is because they were very clever and introduced that term sovereignty to a cloud their actual relationship with the tribes on the u.s continent tribes in the united states have sovereignty and the akaka bill was asking you all to accept that kind of sovereignty right a nation within a nation but the US, the u.s supreme court has said that the sovereignty of indian tribes is whatever congress as interpreted by the supreme court says it is all right so the, the chasing of sovereignty under U.S. terminology is the Akaka Bill. Okay, sorry. I hope that's clear. <laughs> Except that our sovereignty is based on the fact that we were a kingdom. And inherent sovereignty is what we have to redefine ourselves as far as self-determination goes. What, what kind of sovereignty has to be redefined? Inherent sovereignty oh, is yeah, in yeah. the public law 103-150, uh -huh. but we as a people have to define that ourselves. So we're going to, but, I'll let you, we're going to to yes. we'll come back to Aloha, um, I'm going to jump, I'm going to bring into the room some kupuna that were in the movie. Uh, the movie made me tear up quite a bit, but it also made me smile because I saw familiar faces like Auntie Clara Kakalia, who kind of is going to give the theme of what I'm going to share with you tonight. Uh, I also want to bring in Kamaka Hukilani Vanohafen and Anita Govea, both of whom helped us when we fought for the sacred places in Halava Valley. And it's been said 50, over 50 years that I personally have been dealing with what H3 has done to our people and to our places. So 50 years since 1972. And I'm still fighting them. They still refuse. The federal government, state of Hawaii, refused to make right the wrongs that were done. So, and I want to share the word pono that was used by this wonderful speaker here. I look at the word pono as meaning um, balance. So seeking the balance, Malama Pono is seeking the balance in all things. And I think that was part of the core cultural values of our people. And as we move forward, we have to have that balance in our decision making. We cannot just um, naively think we can go out and, and, and wage war with a powerful country like the US government. We need to have more guns and money than the US government in order to prevail if we think that's the shortcut to getting self-determination because really what we're looking for is the ability to determine for ourselves the future of our families and our communities and our and our pai aina hawaii and um that's not going to be easy the hope the u.s government will not give up hawaii very easily and um so what i'm urging everyone is to fight the US government with their own laws. So if you are illegal students, law students anywhere, that's what you have to do is bone up every way you can and get, this brings Clara Kakalia back into the picture. Clara was active in community stuff, but she was also active in, in the movement for self-determination. You saw her in many of those marches, marching into the rooms and all the gatherings that they had. She was also really active in the state government. She was active in, um, politics she she worked in the democratic party she was a, a solid warrior woman and she taught me that you can get a lot done from the inside if you get into these organizations that make change you can't just do it from outside the window looking in you have to and you can't just throw a bomb and blow up the window you have to find a way to change people from within so i took clara's um modeling I went to work for the Board of Water Supply for many years. And before that, I worked for media. So I actually got to help people like um, uh, my friend here with Waiholi Waikani with the news articles that we ran in the newspaper. Calvin Say, right. Oh. Calvin Ho, sorry. See, I'm old and tired. But anyway, we, wrote a, we ran a lot of stories about the movements in the communities and in the Hawaiian, in the Hawaiian people, among the Hawaiian people. So you have to work from within. I worked at Board of Water Supply, and what I tried to do was get them to look at Vai, 
through a Hawaiian perspective. So we ran all of their cons conservation ads using Hawaiian music and Hawaiian themes, and that's what we tried to do. Um, after I left, they kind of got slower on that, but that's okay. We tried to move it from the inside. We're trying to do that now with the US military. We don't believe anything they say, but we have to change them one person at a time. So that's what I do. I do it as a volunteer. I don't get paid to do it. I, my colleagues also do, other Hawaiians. We're trying to work with them one at a time to get them to understand why we're so angry. Um, some of them get it because of Red Hill, but I think we're at the edge of something that could change if more people would do that. Um, the answer really is a, a, a duality. It's partly the politics, but the politics still, we get exploited by everybody, even by Hawaiians. I mean, I'm so sad when I see a Hawaiian taking advantage of, and it, I have witnessed a lot of that in the last 50 years, where Hawaiians we love disappoint us. And I tell my kupuna, Kahiko, my, my kupuna have gone on. I can't fix all these Hawaiians that are disappointing us. You have to talk to them. You have to work on them. Yeah. So maybe it's partly spiritual, but it also is strategic. You have to figure out where are the weaknesses in their arguments and you gotta find the legal ways to win and the community ways of changing pe people's hearts. You can't just change them through the heads, you gotta change them through the hearts. And the challenge in Hawaii is we're not just Hawaiians here. And many of us Hawaiians are not pure Hawaiians. We're a mixture of blood and we're a mixture of cultures. So we have to kind of find the balance and we have to find a way to, to achieve our desire for self-determination in a pono way. So that's all I can share. I hope it helps. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we jump into questions, and if you have questions in the audience, just raise your hands and we'll get a microphone over to you. I'm, I'm just going to jump in really quick. Um, this happened in 1993, 100 years after the overthrow, 30 years from today. Um, 1978 is a date, is a year that stands out for a lot of different reasons, but you had different organizations in 1993. You had the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, you had Kalahui Hawaii. And you know, you know, the media is the media, and they may sensationalize things. Um, to date myself a little bit, I was seven years old when the tribunal happened. So I learned about this from actually reading this book. This is how I learned about it. Um, how did this happen here? You know, we heard a lot in the movie about what happened at this tribunal. How did we get this group together to come here? And I'm not sure if you know, you fight, folks might have some insights. Well, you'll notice in the film that there was a tribute given to Kavai Puna Prajin. And Kavai Puna, um, for many years, he went to help other indigenous nations with their issues because he wanted to learn more and wanted to learn more about the options. And so he came back and he was speaking with Uncle Kikuni and a lot of us that were with the Tribunal Komike, the Kapal Kalko, and other sovereignty groups and self determination groups. And he was just so full of energy about how indigenous peoples needed to come together and define ourselves as not only peoples and nations, but to, to bring our rights together. And there were all different people who were doing like co-governance, let's say like the Maori, you know, where they have half of the budget of their country and they make the decisions for their own people on their own lands. So he was looking at all these different models saying, you know, we feel like we're stuck. It's just what we got. But there's so many other people that are progressing. We need to meet with them and learn with them and come together. And so um, he died and very soon after that. And so um, everybody came to uncle and said, you know, you have the commitment to do this. You have the radicalization of seeing the health of our people and knowing that things have to change. So uncle mortgaged his house and started pulling in people from the different committees, going to all the different islands, and it was a go. I mean, everybody wanted to do it and wanted to be able to identify all the issues that we all need to know about and share the kuleana in. Of course, at that time, there weren't as many of us as there are now. But then 
from that came the public law 103-150, which put into four pages, basically the history of our overthrow and was signed as a law of apology by Bill Clinton. So that kind of laid everything out in a way that everybody could become more commonly involved with and it could be a common knowledge that other people could know about. At the same time at the UN, the decade for uh, the rights of indigenous people, but for indigenous peoples was being formed in Geneva with a working group. So the tribunal was asked to go and represent like something that my Vaughn was referring to is that we are sovereign as a nation, as a kingdom, but we're also inherently sovereign as a people who have um, evolved throughout time through thousands of years in, in our own culture in isolation from the rest of the world and before the colonial governments. So we went to present those two positions and to show that we had the first apology from a superpower from the United States. We showed the tribunal film there and people got involved with the tribunal, but before the, when the tribunal was being formed, there had been other tribunals and other people who had looked for legal and international law, you know, help because of the genocide convention, which everything that happened to us is genocide. The destruction of, of our lands and all of our the life forms in Hawaii, it's a genocide. Everything going on right now with the poisoning of our water is genocide. So you have to look for something that covers everything, right? So indigenous peoples realized that that was part of what happened. But when we got there, like I said, they made it illegal to use genocide. So we had to create the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples which a lot of it was drafted by Moana Jackson, who you saw in the film, because coming from Maori nations and tribes who have had to work things out with their own cultural laws, his goal was to use cultural law and not colonial law. Hmm. And so he drafted Millie Lenny, if she'd been here tonight, she could tell you she was part of the drafting. But how this all comes together created a decade with which about 800 indigenous peoples and nations all were represented in a process together. And all that talking and exchange of information and mana and wisdom and everything that came out of it is what brings us um, to the point today where like my one was saying, some people are actually operationalizing parts of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples or like in Canada, there's 600 nations within Canada, indigenous nations. Because Trudeau is open to it, they're getting their lands back, they're getting money, they're getting compensation and benefits. All of the schools that were created where they were assimilated and killed and their children were taken and killed, their compensation is coming from that, not that it will ever make any difference with money, but they're able to build their own hospitals and schools and things like that. So there's a lot of different models that have come from the tribunal. And you know we may need to make one based upon um, the s situation that we find ourselves in now. Yeah, Kumu John. When you asked that question, I thought you might be asking also about, you know, what kind of political consciousness was present in Hawaii that would, would make something like that possible. Because it doesn't, it doesn't just come about because a few people organize it. it it's really driven by um, a really strong and powerful political and social movement that had been going on since the 1960s directly but I mean, even that, even, even, the, even the push for statehood, which was pushed by some Kanaka Maoli in, in the Democratic Party in the 1940s and 1950s after the Second World War, um, you know, actually relatives of, of um, 1970s and 1980s activists like Honani K. Trask, the, the, the elements of this were Kalama Valley, Waiholi Waikane. They were people struggles. They were organized by communities. Um, they, Kaho Olave. But I mean, even these communities didn't necessarily have broad-based support. Um, you know, a lot of people can, you know, were believed that the opponents to development in on the windward side were, were crazy, um, misinformed, um, and had no right to do what they were doing. But they were successful 
in large part because they happened one after another. You know, Kahalu, um, Waiholi Waikane, Kalama Valley earlier, Heiakea, everywhere. And it, and it seemed like the, the kinds of conversations, the ideas that were coming out of there um, really were magnified in public discourse by music, yeah, um, by musicians, by films, by namaka oka aina, uh, by people documenting, um, people being evicted from Sand Island or Waimanalo. Um, all of these things were done by individuals who had no other resources but their will. And, and that's, that's what I think is really, that's what I think is a common conversation at this, at this table here, is that this movement has been driven by people without, without the resources mm -hmm. um, that so many agencies take for granted. And what we have managed to actually produce since 1993 in social services, in health, and in education, in places where Hawaiians go, they, they come, they get educated, and they go into these places, what we have created there has been incredibly powerful. But it's not enough. And, it's, and it can only be rectified if we start to actually control the resources uh, that, that are needed. Um, for us to properly care for ourselves and for our communities. I, I don't know, you know, a lot of the conversation here too. Thank you, Maivon. And, and Nalani, the conversation about what that government looks like to me is less relevant than the fact that we've been governing ourselves now pretty successfully for the last 30 years with nothing. Imagine. Imagine what we could do if the resources of the state were properly sent out to the communities, not to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, you know, not to agencies that have been set up basically to siphon off money, but were actually made available to the communities in place. What we could do to improve the quality of life in those communities, what we could do to make things better so that we don't have so many run-ins with the police, so that our young people actually have hope. And the, and, and the ability, you know, to, to succeed. Um, we really, to me, this is really the lesson of, uh, of the tribunal because they did that on one man mortgaging his house. I just want to add, oh, I'm sorry. Um, where we were fortunate also was Kekuni was a medical doctor. You know, and I was fortunate to see some of his letters and we we're going through his files where he had these aha moments while he was in college, you know, sharing books with Kilolani Mitchell. And he goes, Oi, I didn't know we had all these problems. And he actually says in one of those, Where have I been? <laughs> and then totally pivoted and acted on it. And well, you know, my experience with Kekuni was specifically in in the health field because that was my area what he did was he he challenged his own institutions the medical system you know first i heard you could have sued the queen's medical center you know he, he was so bold that way you know to to say we can change this even at the university and the medical school he wasn't always supported at the university and the things he did and mahalo for bringing in um uh, cornell west you know, those institutions were not built for us. And, you know, we keep trying to manipulate it and get in there, but Kikuni really challenged us to say, why does all the money have to go there? Why do we have to do it that way? You know, he, he taught me how to ask questions, you know, like, why is that? And I remember um, the big issue in education was everybody's low self-esteem in the Hawaiian community. And while people were protesting, he goes, I don't see a self-esteem problem there. You know, he was just so great at, having us look at our strengths too. We had to build the case of our health disparities to get attention for health disparities. But that was one half of the coin. The other was how did we survive so long and what were we existing on? And it was people mortgaging their house or someone 
investing in la'ala pa'al. So he was really good about that. But the fact that he was also a medical doctor, he pulled in the health people. And because we were all kind of siloed and independent and in systems. And he, he, made, he introduced us to each other. He would bring us into the room to lobby for the Native Hawaiian healthcare. We'd be like, oh, I didn't know they were Hawaiian. You know, I mean, we didn't even know who we were in the system and identifying the doctors. So, you know, in that part of the movement, he was so instrumental. And we see the results of that. We have, and they invested in education to fill the missing spots for Hawaiians in health, physicians. You know, that's why Papa Ololokahi and that legislation had a scholarship program and investing in the physicians first, because it was going to take, it would take the longest to get out of school. But yeah, he was so important in that, in that um, part of the, the system. Mahalo. I'm just hoping we can hear more from people, yeah. everybody else who's here. Yeah, maybe we go k first and then oh, okay. raise your hand if you want to <laughs> say something. I just wanted to call out one of the areas where I think if we had to look at the stark changes that have occurred and what can we celebrate and where are we making strides and where is AIA alive and vibrant. And I want to call out our, our education system. We, I, I think in a lot of ways, Hawaiian Focus Charter Schools, and I'm looking at a founder here, I'm looking at one of the pillars here. I think, I, I know I saw a board member of Halo Kumana here. I see a home alumni of Hawaiian Focus Charter Schools. I think it's one of the places where we have been able to decolonize our minds and our hearts and our souls and our hands and our feet and be able to see our, our, our youth um, be Hawaii and have it in their, in, their, in their whole being. And I see the difference between my daughter and my son and, and who they are and what, what's just automatic for them and what it just comes so natural and, and what they're so passionate about. It's stuff that came to, to, to me. And, and, and you know, I'm a child of a father who was like fully in the movement. And yet what I see in them is something that's so much more powerful. And so this is a little mahalo to those of you who created that. And, and, and I think it's just something that we should see as a place of strength where when we're talking about this, this part of the movement, right, and this sort of cultural engagement that's so vibrant and so important, like this side is nothing if we don't have this, right? And so this is, on this side, I think that's one of the places where we do have strength and if we can, and if we can get more of that, I think about the Ka'awai program that you folks have, have nurtured and how that's married with the Hawaiian Focus Charter Schools, right? And all of these different um, ave ave that are, are growing and, and getting stronger and stronger. And it's, it's super powerful. Um, and, and it's really born of, of work that, that began long ago. And it's part of this whole you know, system to say, you know, frick all of this stupid stuff that we get taught. And, and we really need to take a pele approach to a pele and hi'iaka approach. We've been doing only hi'iaka. We got to do the pele side, like blow that freaking shit up. Um, <laughs> Right? We, why are we having the same, you know, stupid curriculum, graduation requirements? Why are we doing that? We're putting ourselves in this indoctrination container. Why are we doing this to our youth? And I think, you know, right now, Hawaiian Focus Charter School is our first place where they're saying, we're going to blow up, blow up some of that shit and, and teach our kids what we really need them to learn. And that is such a powerful form of AIA that's, that's happening right now. So, and, and the beauty of it, too, is that what I think people would have considered radical back in 1993 is actually common knowledge. I mean, people just generally accept it now as, as, the, as the truth, right? And that's a beautiful legacy, I, I think, uh, one of the legacies of things like the tribunal. Um, yeah, Mr. Hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll get microphone coming to you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. My name is Kelvin. Oh, <clears throat> I um, nineteen seventy one, came home from Micronesia. I supposed to go to Vietnam, and I was like, oh, went to the Peace Corps, and then I 
kind. You know, I, I don't know, they, they, they say uh, we standing on their shoulders. I, I cannot figure them out if we standing on their shoulders or they standing on our shoulders. <laughs> I, I think it's both. But when we, when we get our kupuna, whoa, <laughs> we get thousands of years of people backing us up. Mm -hmm. And um, the Kachola girl, kind of, um, <laughs> up in, in uh, Mauna Kea, yeah? Her and Gonzo, what is his name? Gonzo. Yeah. Oh, look, those guys, those guys mean. <laughs> okay, you know, because they put them on a kind of, I don't know, on, on a computer kind of stuff. The bugger is all around the world. And uh, still doing that kind of stuff. It's, um, but I think, you know, where we was, in 1959, you know, uh, up to 1970, us, the renaissance of Cacholas and all other guys getting together in Mount Kea now. We're in pretty good shape, you know, and we're telling the stories. We got to tell the story. And we got to tell the stories ourselves. You know, the United States told our stories because they make the government and they tell us what, what, tell the whole world what's going on. Now we telling the story. Osorio, what, 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 your partner, his name? No, 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 no. You, you're your daughter too. I mean, they all, <laughs> oh, all these people telling stories. You know, kind of um, Randy, Borden, oh. oh, storytellers, storytellers, her daughters, storytellers, my sons, storytellers. We gotta tell the stories. We gotta encourage our people to tell the stories. Get them out there. Oh, John Burring over there. Mean. Maka Oka Aina watching. All those films they put on. You know, so 19, uh, Waihole Waikani time. So I was vice president and I knew we had to tell the world what was happening. Otherwise, us guys is nothing, you know. Oh, kind of mean though. I got, I got interviewed by Barbara Walters. <laughs> <laughs> Today show at the Waihole Poi Pachi. That's crazy. I mean, you know, when Obama, he was one of the last ones that uh, interviewed by Barbara Walters. Oh. I, I got interviewed by her in 1972. We got to tell the stories. We get plenty of storytellers. Mm -hmm. And we got to just keep on telling the stories. And, and um, I came because I heard, oh, they're going to digitize and make all the kind of films, you know, circulate them again. And because they're still playing, the guys made our, our film, Kalopa'ao Waihole. And then they like make them more fancy. It was 59 minutes, Kalopa'ao Waihole. They cut them in half. And then they call them Stolen Waters. <laughs> John Burry and Puipa. <laughs> and the bugger went all around the world about the water fight. Okay. Kalopa, the hard terror of Waihole, because Aska is pa'akiki. And we still standing up for 
our rights. And um, we got to make friends. You know, I saw up in uh, um, up Mauna Kea, the United States, they ain't never going to recognize us. <laughs> they get too much to lose. No can. We got to recognize ourselves. We have to do what we have to do to have our nation and be our people. I like that kind of ahupua. Us guys, hakipu guys. We. We know how to live in Hakipu. Kind of, we we teaching our kids, my boys. Plenty of you know my boys, and then we, my boys are teaching their kids. I, uh, I'm very. Um, I'm very excited about the future because of my grandchildren and because of my grandchildren's grandchildren. Because I, as kupuna, we're going to live forever, yeah? We have to, and we have to keep learning, but like I tell my grandchild, or my granddaughter, Kind of, cause uh, okay, one one time for me, Paul talk already. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> that kind of, but um, as guys, we build our house. The bug are big, and no more electricity. So not kind of dark, eh? But we had enough. And then my my granddaughter, she she, she the guys was living with us. So she tell me, oh, to tell me. Um, you can take me to the bathroom. Yeah, I can, but you can go by yourself. Oh, duh. Okay. okay and, uh, yeah, I take you, but Emma, you got to remember, I'm always with you. And I'm always going to be with you. So you don't need to be scared, you know. I'm always going to be with her. She's always going to be with me. She is me. Her grandchildren can be her. That's who we are. That's where we're going. Anyway, mahalo. Mahalo. <laughs> um, that is uh, actually a very poignant and beautiful way to, to actually end tonight's um, panel discussion. Um, Officially, we're going to get kicked out because security is out there. Um, there will be another discussion here next week, um, another film that's going to be shown and more, more talk story time. But um, thank you again, Joan, for that, giving us this reminder that I think we all needed in this, this, this time. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. Really appreciated your mana'o. Um, and hopefully we'll see you folks next week. Mahalo and aloha. Take care.